All right, so let me work through this question. This is uh, in the um, same category as the thin film interference because you use the same set of tools to work through this question. So it says uh, microscope slide some length long. Okay, uh, I guess that's somehow going to be relevant. Some uh, length long. Is separated from a glass plate. Uh, so here's the glass plate here below, and here's a something that's providing the thickness. Are we given the thickness of the? Oh, we are. So let me label this T, and we'll be looking for that. What is the thickness of the piece of paper? So um, there's some height here, as shown below. The other side is in contact with the plate. The slide is illuminated from above. So you should imagine some light coming from above and reflecting in one surface here, and then um, reflecting from this surface here. Um, so it's illuminated sodium lamp, and these many fringes per centimeter are seen along the slide. All right, so let me start by just uh, writing down some expression dealing with uh, this uh, interference. So um, as a reminder of what we cover when we talk about thin film interference, so there's a portion of the beam path that's common to both uh, reflected beams. So those that part you can kind of ignore. The incident beams as they come down, up to this part or up to right this part here um, they are uh, it's the one in the same beam so there's no phase difference occurring in this spot as reflection is occurring um, so this is now going to be treated as its own thing let me call it beam one so we have to think about what phase shift might be affecting beam one we'll look at that and then it's a, so so there's a something potentially happening at the reflection here and there's a uh, bunch of things that could be affecting phase of the light ray that's uh, going through here traveling that additional distance and then reflecting here and then traveling this additional distance back now from this point and on are going to be uh, common for both beams. So let me label this uh, the beam path two. So for paths one and two, we need to think through, okay, what um, things affect their phase? So um, the phase shift that could be offering to beam, uh, beam one, let me call that phi one, that would be happening only to beam one and not two. Um, so there's this reflection here, and you need to think through here. Here's the diagram of it. it uh, for that reflection, it's coming from the glass side. So let's say n equals 1.5, and the other side of the boundary is air. So n equals 1. So when you have a reflection occurring on that surface, um, you have to think through the rule. Uh, in the lecture, I gave you the rules for the phase shift. So uh, phase shift occurs when reflecting from a lower index of refraction to higher index of refraction. Um, and for the circumstances relevant for this class, we are only looking at phase shift of pi, uh, pi phase shift. So for this reflection, it's going from higher to lower, so no phase shift. It's just going to be... Um, so the additional phase that you might have to account for beam 1 is actually 0. So no phase to worry about for beam 1. Let's look at beam 2. That could be a few uh, contributions. So one contribution, one source of phase shift is going to be simply this extra distance that the beam travels. So I'm going to call it, let's say, uh, phase shift due to... Um, um, let me call, label this distance x because it, it feels like this uh, thickness of t will be the thickness of paper. So I'll, um, I'll say due to um, extra distance. And uh, just so I don't make this mistake in the future, 
um, because the beam is traversing through distance to distance, uh, the beam is traversing through this distance twice. It's really distance of two x, and I will spell out exact expression for what this looks like. But I will account for that uh, shift of phase for the beam number two, and beam number two reflects from here. So we need to think of the reflection. Let me set this up. It's reflecting from air, which has index of refraction of about 1 into glass. Let's say index of refraction of 1.5. So we see that um, according to this rule, there's going to be an additional factor of uh, pi uh, plus uh, pi phase shift that's going to enter into beam 2. So yeah, it's a... Uh, um, so... so you consider this a phase shift affecting these two beams. Let me write out the full expression so that I'm working with the whole set. So for this portion here, really the expression you want to start out from is the uh, fraction or um, the how much this distance, um, how much of the cycle of uh, oscillation of optical electric field that this distance amounts to. So you start out with the distance. So 2x is the distance that it's traveling. And if you are thinking in terms of cycles of some wave, then you want to divide it by lambda. And normally you have to be careful. It's the lambda within the medium that you are dealing with. Uh, so that's sub supposed to be subscript, lambda sub n. Um, and this lambda sub n in general cases will be the its a vacuum wavelength divided by the the index of refraction of the material. Uh, you can work through. Here, uh, because it's in air, uh, this is just going to end up being the vacuum wavelength. So this gives you the um, how much phase there is in the unit of cycles, which really isn't the unit we want to keep with. We want the unit of radiance. That's uh, how this was expressed. So we want to multiply this by 2 pi so that we have a phase difference, phase shift in the unit of radiance. So with all of this, what your uh, phase shift in beam 2 is um, 2 pi times 2x divided by lambda. Here I'm going to use vacuum wavelength plus phi, uh, phi p, pi. <laughs> um, so that is the uh, phase shift that's in beam 2. And uh, let me leave it as a, a function of x. This x, the thickness x, is going to be a function of where you are. On this far end here, x will be 0. On this other far end, the x will be t. So, all right, let me make some room here, and then let's uh, um, work through how to get the information that they are asking for in the question. So, they are asking for the uh, thickness of the piece of paper. And they've given the information in a bit of an unusual way. Um, some number of fringes per centimeter. Um, okay. Um, I feel like the easiest to make, way to make use of this is this. Uh, they've given me the total number of centimeters of this length. So I can um, calculate the total number of fringes. So... Um, total number of fringes n is going to be, let me call this quantity that they're giving you lowercase n. That's the uh, number of fringes. It's the fringe density. Uh, number of fringes per centimeter. And this n is going to be the total number of fringes. Total number of fringes. Um, that's simply going to be the fringe density times the centimeter. So, okay. So I have the number of fringes that way, which means, um, so I start with a fringe count of zero. Zero. Um, so if I start with a dark fringe here, let's say, um, yeah, because at x equals zero, there will be pi phase difference. So I'll start with a dark fringe here. 
and then I count one, two, three, four, and so on, and count all the way up to, so let me just have a number, uh, a concrete number so that I'm not speaking in hypotheticals. Uh, 14 fringes per centimeter times 8.6 centimeters, so 128.4 fringes. 100, um, so I count, and by the time I get here, I'll have counted 124 uh, fringes. Uh, so I think uh, this is a large enough number that this pi phase shift, whether we account for or not, wouldn't really make a difference. Because what this difference this makes is a half a fringe. You know, 120.4 versus 119.9. It's within 1%, so I, I could just forget about it and it'll be fine. So, anyways. So, by the time we get here, so we have total end at the um, uh, paper end. And I think what we want to say is, oh, so um, this is going to be the number of um, cycles um, difference between V2 and V1. And uh, I want to make a bit of a last minute shift. And instead of expressing things in radians as I have here, and which I will still say is the best thing to do in the general case, here I think I'm just going to write out what the number of cycles is in the units of cycles. So I'll have the 2x over lambda, or 2t over lambda, because I'm at the thickness end, plus this pi phase shift in the unit of cycles is going to be a half cycle. So I say this is equal to that. I have n as a numerical value. I have lambda as a numerical value here. And uh, I just need to solve for t. It's the one unknown. Oh, so let me actually use my uh, Sage math as a computer algebra system. So I have my variables, t, lambda, and uh, n. Uh, that's going to be this number that I just calculated. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to type in the equation that I want solved. Oh, oh yeah, lambda is a... Um, it's a special Python keyword. You can't override it like what to say. It's a land. Uh, so let me write down the equation. The equation that I want solved for is the total number is equal to 2 times thickness divided by lambda plus uh, 1 half or 0 0.5. And I'm just going to use solve, for, solve a function to solve for t, which is really a late thing to do. But that's fine. I can do it. solve equation for t in terms of everything else. It'll solve, and that's my solution. <laughs> Let me put that into a variable. Um, so I'm going to take the uh, first element there and substitute in the values. n is going to be equal to what I calculated above, 120.4. And uh, lambda is going to, I think it's going to simplify things for me if I plug in lambda in the unit I want. So I want the thickness in the unit of millimeter. So let me plug in lambda in the unit of millimeter. So that's going to be uh, 589 times 10 to the power of minus 9 for the nanometer. Um, so this is in the unit of meters. And to convert the unit of meters into millimeter, I multiply this by 10 to the power of 3, because uh, 1 meter is 1,000 millimeters. Um, yeah, I think I can just do that. That gets me thickness of 0 0.0353 millimeter. guess that's reasonable. Let's give that a try. 0 0.0353. 0.0. And that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a, um, it's the kind of, a lot of the uh, thin film interference questions, you do have to think it through. And this one, I think I could have done it a little bit more quickly, sorry. It's been a little bit rusty in practice, so I'm thinking through. Uh, this is kind of the generic approach 
uh, which you know it can be a good kind of way to warm up <laughs> and then I ended up coming up with a slightly different expression to just uh, write out um, write out an equation that relates to the quantity that they give you with the quantity that they're asking you for in a more generic way. That's the kind of the general physics problem solving strategy, which I've done. Okay, let me look at one more question. Um, it's the next question, which also deals with a similar setup. Uh, let's see. So this is the question. To micro... Uh, so let me just put it here. So to microscope slides made of glass are illuminated by some monochromatic light instant perpendicularly, what we've been describing here. Top slide touches the bottom slide at one end, okay, and rests on a thin copper wire at the other end. Uh, paper, copper wire, doesn't matter, some thickness. Ah, diameter of the copper wire is this. So they've given us thickness here, and they are now asking, uh, and yeah, forming a wedge of thin uh, wedge of air. It's this so it's the exact same picture. This paper is the thin copper wire. How many bright fringes are seen across these slides? Ah, this is why I love doing things in symbolic form. So I've written this equation here, describing the previous question. Um, the equation I've written being this one here, the equation. And basically everything I've written in this equation still applies. Uh, if I, it, it's the same physical picture, um, same kind of setup. So equation describing how the total number of fringes is given by this, all of this still applies. I don't have to change a single, single thing about the equation I programmed it. The only thing I need to program, I need to change is what you are solving for. Before we were, we were solving for thickness t. This time, instead of thickness t, we are solving for the total number of fringes n. Um, now I guess you do, yeah, yeah. So let's do that, and then we'll look at the numbers that comes out, and then work from there. So when you solve it for n, oh wait, it's already solved for n. <laughs> That's such a silly thing to do. Equation is already solved for n. But let me put that solution into a variable. And I can get that the first element there. And then plug in the numbers that we have. Uh, we have numbers of thickness. Um, so let's plug in both to the thickness and the wavelength in micrometer and the units will cancel out and we'll get a nice thing. So the thickness is 25.2 micrometer and for the wavelength, uh, 570 nanometer, so times 10 to the power of minus nine. And then to convert, um, so this is in meters, Convert to convert meters into micrometer, I multiply this by 10 to the power of six. Uh, there's a million micrometers in a meter. So, okay, let's see what we get when we do that. The number of fringes is 88.9. Um, so when it asks how many bright fringes are seen across these slides, um, I don't remember exactly how the pro uh, question is programmed in. I will just uh, spell out two possibilities. So they could be looking for number of fringes is 89, you know, round to nearest. I can imagine question actually asking for this to be rounded down to 88. So you start out with a dark fringe here. And uh, if you have 89 cycle, so, you know, dark and then at 0.5 of the cycle, you have bright. And then, so as you count those, as you get to the end, you'll only have counted 88. You won't have counted 89. So let me try 89 first. And then if it says, oh, that's wrong, I'll do 88. So let's do 89 first. And then it might say that's wrong. Then, okay, because we've counted only up to 88. And whatever fraction of fringes we have, until we have an integral number, we haven't seen the bright fringe yet, so okay, 
Let's try 88. And it says that's correct. Yeah, it's um, it's a, here. It's a more more matter of a semantics. You know, it's asking how many bright fringes are seen, and you can only see integer number of bright fringes. You can see a half a bright fringe. Um, that, this is why you have practically infinite attempts, so that if the question is being fussy about how you round your numbers, hey, give a few different choices a try so that uh, <laughs> so that question being fussy about how you round the numbers doesn't get in the way of your understanding underlying physics itself. So yeah, these two questions very closely related. I really only had to do it once and just use the same result twice.